Good afternoon, folks. Want, we want to welcome you once again to our uh, discipleship program sponsored by the River of Life Assembly here in Miramichi, New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, we're glad for each one that is viewing today, whether you be on Facebook or YouTube, uh, whichever venue that you are uh, using, uh, we appreciate you being here. And uh, we just uh, are asking that God would touch your heart in a special way as we open the Word of God, that you'd open your heart and allow His Spirit to speak to you. We're going to look at the Word of God today, and uh, we're going to look at, actually, the Word of God. That's what our subject is going to be upon, the Word of God. And uh, before we begin, we're going to just unite our hearts together in prayer and ask God's blessing upon His Word and upon your hearts. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and mercy. It's forever settled. And Lord, we ask you today that you would touch your people and those that are listening online, whatever venue it might be, that you would speak to their hearts as we share the word of God, that the word of God would go deep into their spirits and their innermost being, strengthen them and help them to live for you. And if that one might be one, Lord, today, that is not serving you, that the word of God would touch their hearts in such a way that it would quicken them and move them in, in a way that would draw them closer to you and help them to surrender to you and make you Lord of their lives. Lord, I ask your blessings upon the word of God. I ask you to strengthen my heart and my mind as I minister the word of God, that it would speak to the hearts of people. And we'll be careful to praise you and to glorify you because you are worthy of all praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name. We want to start right off today by just reading two passages of Scripture. Just one is a bit of an introduction. This is in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, the fourth chapter and the first verse. The wise man, Solomon, said, Listen, my sons, to a father's instructions. Pay attention and gain understanding. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction and pay attention and gain understanding. The book of 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 15 through 17. And, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The wise man in the Old Testament said that the young man should pay attention to the instruction of his father and, and uh, to give heed to instruction. And we have instruction that has been given to us by our Heavenly Father. And he has provided instruction for us that will help us as we live for him and as we walk through this life. Listen to what he said in 2 Timothy. I want to read it for you again. And how from infancy, it's Paul writing, talking about Timothy, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Then he says that those Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Then he says, all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible, the Word of God, is inspired. The King James uses that word instead of saying God breathed. It says inspired. It comes from two Greek words, which means theo, which is God, and the nuance, which breathe. So God breathe. It, just, it doesn't just simply, the Bible doesn't just simply contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. If you were to say the Bible contains the Word of God, then you would be saying, well, if I take this book and I go from cover to cover, somewhere in 
between the covers, I will be able to find some things that consist of or are the or is the Word of God. But friend, the beauty of this book is that from the first cover to the very last cover, this is the Word of God. It has been inspired. It is God-breathed. God reveals Himself in two ways. God reveals Himself in a general revelation. That's a, a natural way through creation. You can look around at the works of, of nature, the seasons, the life cycles of animals and plants, all those things, they reveal God to a, to a measure. There's the laws of nature, the laws of logic, the laws of mathematics, the laws of gravity, the laws of thermodynamics, the laws that cause uh, a plane to be able to rise and to come down because of the way the air flows. There are laws that are written in nature that help reveal God to us. But those laws can also be uh, corrupted because nature itself has been corrupted. It's been cursed. It's fallible. The Bible says that when man fell that God said cursed is the, is the ground. And because of the, of the curse, man was going to have to toil in order to bring forth crops, in order to have food and sustenance. Man was going to have to toil with the earth in order to bring those things forth. But there is not only just simply the general revelation or the natural one, but there is a special revelation that comes from God. And it's in two parts. One is Holy Scripture, which has been inspired or breathed by God. And there is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. They are both infallible. They are both uh, without error. No mistakes. Jesus, when we talk about the incarnation, that's dealing with Jesus on the face of this earth. He was perfect, infallible, and inerrant. But when we come to looking at the Word of God, the Word of God is infallible, it's inerrant, and it's incorruptible. It's perfect. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of St. John, the Gospel of St. John, the 17th chapter. And here we go. John, the 17th chapter and verse 17. And Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus is, says, my prayer is not that you take, he's praying for the, his followers, his disciples, and he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word, who's he speak referring to? He's referring to God. Your word is truth. So God's word is truth. It's not, in, it's not errant, it's not uh, corrupted, it's not impure, it's perfect. Matthew, the 24th chapter, last chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. He's talking about the sign of the ages. And in the 24th chapter and the 25th verse, he says this. And where are we? Do, do. Matthew 24, verse 25. And it takes me a second here to get down to. Hmm, my apologies, I wrote down the wrong one, but what the scripture actually says, he says, my word is true. And he says, heaven and earth will pass away but my word will never pass away. So even though sometimes we think, well, why does that sound so, so ridiculous? That can't be true. But the word of God is not going to pass away. It's not going to change. 
and it is always true. My, I'm reminded uh, of a story that I, I heard one time. Actually, it's in the Old Testament. There was a king that uh, wanted the prophet. The prophet came with a, a prophecy in the, script, the scripture to him and uh, presented to him. And the king got so mad, he took the scroll. And the Bible says he used a pen knife. And he began to cut out the things that he didn't like. But friend, if the word of God is forever settled in heaven, it doesn't matter if you want to tear something out of it. It doesn't matter if you disagree with it. It doesn't matter if you want to take a black marker and cross it out. But at the end of it all, no matter what you think you hold here, the word of God that's forever settled in heaven is going to still remain. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. The Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. Again, the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. And here is what John says. He says that God's promises, they cannot be broken. John 10 and verse 35. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture, he says, cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be broken. One place the Bible says, the promises of God are yea and amen to them that believe. They are yes and amen. Yea and amen to them that believe. When we know what the Word of God says, you can do whatever you want to try and change it or to supplant it or twist it or do whatever you want, but the Word of God is still forever written. It's yes and amen. It is there. It's going to last forever. I remember a story that was told to me when I was just a, a kid, and uh, they said that the, this man, he got so upset about hearing about holiness preached and about living right and, and doing right by your neighbor and, and being a good person, that he, he said, I'm just tired of hearing about this holiness all the time, and I'm going to take that Bible and I'm going to tear every page out where I find the reference to holy. And he started tearing the, the Bible apart, and he ended up with practically nothing but a cover. And he, he got mad, and he threw the cover down, and it landed face up. And when it landed face up, he looked at the cover, and it said, Holy Bible. So he, you, you, you can't just decide, I'm going to take this out, I'm going to take that out. The Word of God is forever settled. It will never pass away. It is there, and it cannot be broken. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read from the 12th verse. There we go. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and the 12th verse says this. For the word of God is living. Notice that. The word of God is living and active. King James says it's quick and powerful. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So his word is a living thing. It's a breathing thing. What did we say? It was inspired, which meant God breathed. And in the very beginning, God breathed in man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God's word is a living thing. It has a life, a power to it. That's why it's, it has, uh, the Bible says, it's quicken, it has a quickening power. Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts 
and the attitudes of the heart. It's a powerful thing. You know, we can come against the enemy of our soul and we can use all kinds of uh, philosophies. We can use all kinds of programs. We can use all kinds of themes and ideas to try and destroy the enemy when he comes against us. But Jesus, when the enemy came against him, he simply said, it is written. It is written. It is written. And he overcame the tempter. And in your life, when you face struggles, when you face an, uh, 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 an enemy that comes against you that would try and destroy your soul, you can, if you're going to rely on, on themes and philosophies and ideas and concepts and programs, you will end up failing. But if you will go to the Word of God and begin to declare, it is written. David, the apostles, or the, uh, the Old Testament prophet said, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? What was it going to do? That I might not sin against you. Why? Because the word of God in his heart was going to be a weapon that would be sharper than any two-edged sword and would be able to cut and divide and pierce and penetrate when the enemy would come against him. He could declare the word of God and it would give him victory over the struggle and the situation. So it is a living, powerful, quickening spirit it's, uh, it's there for us in our lives to strengthen us and to help us. Psalms 119. Psalms 119 and verse 89. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. His word is eternal. It stands forever in the heavens. It is fixed. It's a solid rock. It's something that you can relate to, and it is relevant in your life today. You say, how is this book relevant to me today? There are those that say, well, if I preached against this, and you say this is sin, and you say that, and if I get up saying that this is sin and that's wrong, then the, uh, I'm not going to be relevant in this type of a society, in this world today, and just everyone just kind of put me on the back burner because they, they, they don't believe those things anymore. Time has changed. People have changed. Yes, friend, time has changed. People have changed. But God's word and God has not changed. It is the same yesterday, just like him. Yesterday, today, and forever. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. The word of God is relevant. It's a living book. As we mentioned earlier, it's God breathed. It's a living book, so it's alive, it's quickening, it's power, and it is real in your, for your life. It is also one of wisdom, and it's timeless. In its pages, you can find wisdom. Remember the story of the king, King Solomon, when the uh, two women brought the young boy, young child to her, to him before his throne for judgment. And one woman said, this is my baby. And the other woman said, no, he's my baby. And the, she, uh, her, her baby died. She came and stole mine in the middle of the night. And now she won't give him back to me, and he's mine. And, and they couldn't decide. The, all the people that were there, they tried to judge, but they couldn't judge who was the rightful mother. And Solomon looks at them, he says to his servant, take your sword, divide the child in half, give one to, the, to one lady, give the other half to the other. And one lady stands there with her arms folded as if to say, okay, go ahead and do it. And the other one throws herself before the mercy of Solomon and says, spare the child, spare the child. Don't slay the child. Let, let the other lady have the child. And Solomon looks at her and he says, this is the mother. What was it? It was an uncanny sense of wisdom that was given to him. And we're told throughout the Word of God of places where God shows a, 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 an inspired form of wisdom and knowledge that is given to people. And God's Word, God's Word will express to us and give us wisdom. It will help give us wisdom. 
It's timeless, just as Jesus talked in the, the, the Gospel of Mark. Let me read that for you just, just for a moment. Gospel of Mark, Mark the 12th chapter, the 13th through the 17th verse. There we go. Mark, the 12th chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. The 13th through the 17th verse. And later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to whom they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he said. Bring me a denarii and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. What was he showing? He was showing a God-inspired wisdom that we have access to through the Word of God. When we read its pages, there is a wisdom that can be acquired through reading the Word of God. There is an accuracy in the Word of God. It has been never proven wrong, but it is continually validated and substantiated and proven to be correct both by science, by geography, by archaeology, things that they discover that people say, oh, I don't know about that. And 30 years, 40 years down the road, archaeologists will make a discovery and say, oh, this, this tells us about this. And we didn't even realize there was a city here called that. Like Jericho, we hear about the walls of Jericho and how the armies of, of Israel marched around and on the seventh day went around seven times and shouted and the walls came down. And archaeologists have found the uh, ruins for the, 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 the old walls of, of Jericho and they proved that there was a great calamity and the walls fell down inward, not outward, but inward. And uh, it substantiates the word of God. And people said, how oh, that can't be, that can't be. But the word of God is true. The word of God also has a message. The word of God has a message that's clear. It's compelling. It's current. It tells you the plan of God for man. It tells us the plan of God for man. God made man in the beginning, desired to commune with him. Man, because of sin, broke that communion. And because of sin, it, it destroyed the fellowship that God wanted with man. And God has been trying to reestablish that through the ages. And he finally, at the, uh, the culmination of ages, through Jesus Christ, he paid the sacrifice on Calvary to restore our fellowship with God. And he has forever made that sacrifice and settled that condition. And now we can know God in the power of his resurrection. We can walk with him. We can know his love. We can know his mercy. And we can experience him in our lives. So it expresses a message for our lives. And then it teaches values and truths that are timeless. So there's five aspects of the word of God that make it relevant. It's a living book. Its wisdom is timeless. Its accuracy has never been proven wrong. It shows us a message that God has delivered for man through the ages about the plan of God for man. And its values and truth are timeless. They don't change. They don't change. Friend, today, if you will take time to look into the pages of this book, it will show you, it will speak to your heart and show you what Jesus Christ did on Calvary, the price he paid, why he had to pay it in order to redeem our souls. 
Because without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there was no remission of sins. He paid the price to redeem our souls and brought us back into right standing with him. And today, if you will simply open your heart to him as the word of God tells us, if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you can be saved. It means to repent, to ask God to forgive you of your sins, to wash you with his blood, and to come into your life and take up the throne, the throne room of your heart and rule and reign in your life. And he will do that and he'll make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads, shall we? <coughs> Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the word of God that's forever settled in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for it because it's quick and powerful. We thank you because it has revealed to us your love and your grace and your plan. You took your, our place on Calvary when sin demanded a payment. The judgment of that sin was upon us and we were lost. But you who knew no sin took our place on Calvary, shed your blood and died in our place to redeem us. And because of that shed blood, Lord, today, we can walk in victory, overcomers, knowing the power and the love of God being real in our lives and serving you, making you Lord. And Lord, you know the ones that are listening to my voice right now. You know their conditions. You know their hearts. And I pray, Lord, that in the midst of all the things they're going through, that the word of God would pierce through the darkness. It would shine a light into their hearts, cause their spirits to be stirred, and they, they would turn from their ways and follow after you by surrendering to you and asking you to come in to their hearts and become Lord. Wash them, Lord, with your word. Wash them with your love, your mercy, your spirit. Touch them, Lord, and draw them by your grace. I ask you to bless your people and help them today to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We thank you for being with us once again. We look forward to being with you again next week.